Hey everybody, Haku here with my review of last night's new The Walking Dead episode, so Season 7, Episode 7. And uh, this might be a little bit of a longer review. I have a hell of a long list of uh, talking points, things I wanted to talk about about the episode. Um, just because we got through a lot. To me, this felt like the episode that we've got through the most stuff. And that's the thing with, like, it felt so good not being a bottle episode. And what I mean by that is, like, even though you can argue with bottle episodes, we get through a whole story quicker. Like, they're like, imagine if they split up those other stories, it would feel like it took us forever to get through the Heath and Tara stuff, or forever to get through the Hilltop stuff. But I thought it felt a lot better like this. Even though each individual story didn't get as far, it felt like with jumping around and stuff, I got way more notes than usual. It just felt like we got a lot more. And I really, really enjoyed that. And of course, extending the episode helped a ton too. I've been loving the um, extended episodes this season because we already have long Walking Dead seasons, really. We have, well, it's essentially a 16-episode season every year, I mean, really. Uh, that's literally what it is. But essentially, it's more like two eight-episode seasons uh, because of the way we have the long break in the middle. Uh, and I like that we have such a long season, and I like on top of that that we're getting such long episodes. I think that the more Walking Dead, the better for me, I mean, honestly. Um, and I love the way, too, uh, the show remixed the comics here, I thought, very well. And that doesn't just mean, whenever I talk about the show remixing the comics, it doesn't just mean taking things straight from the comics. It also means changing things and doing show original stuff that maybe has nothing to do with the comics. That's it's adapting it by not doing it or by purposefully doing something else and that can be good too because some of the things in the comics it works for TV and I want to see some of those iconic moments brought to life on TV and the show has done a good job of doing that almost every single time and also for adding stuff that wasn't in the comics or changing things from the comics that don't work that well for TV to be completely different I thought that the show did very well with that, and it usually does very well with that. Um, there was only one sort of storyline going on here that was kind of meh, and I think I'll start off with that one, because um, I'm just going to uh, talk about its storyline at a time, rather than jumping around so much so that I, so that I don't miss anything or um, skip over anything. So the first storyline I wanted to talk about in this episode is the Michonne story. That's the only one I thought was a bit weak. And that's just because, uh, uh, not that it doesn't totally make sense, but that it seems almost a bit unimportant. So Michonne's walking down this road, she kills some walkers and makes a roadblock, ends up getting this lady who she just says, okay, this lady's totally a savior. And another thing I was thinking, why is this one savior lady out here alone by herself? But either way, she tells the lady to take her to Negan. And it's just a bit impulsive for me. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really make a ton of sense. It doesn't really improve their situation a lot. I mean, what's she gonna do? This lady takes her to Negan to their base. She can't just kill him there. That comes back on everybody else. Even if she could, by some chance, miraculously even do it. Um, so for me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I wasn't the biggest fan of the Michonne story here. And that's pretty much all I've got on it. Next, the Rick and Aaron story. I do kind of like, even though we rarely got any of it. So Rick and Aaron have stayed overnight in the truck. That means going from a place, traveling by car, and going far enough to stay overnight and come back, you can get a long way. You can get states away, hundreds of miles away. Not in this world, probably, because roads are probably clogged up. But the point is, even if they can only go a quarter of the distance you could today in a day's drive, that's still a pretty long way. They can cover a lot of ground. The world's a pretty big place. Um, so I think that uh, it makes sense that after all of that, that they would be able to find some weird thing like they found. So they came over this sign and they hop, or the sign on a fence and they just hop the fence, go up in there and uh, see another sign and they see this boathouse in the middle of a pond that is supposedly filled with supplies, uh, ammo, and um, supplies, weapons, ammo, food as well. So I think that uh, that's 
pretty cool. Um, in the little promo we see for next episode, where they break off the boards to paddle with and the boat that's full of holes, I was thinking two things. I was like, why don't doesn't it make sense for only one person to go in the boat in the boat not because Aaron is scared or anything but because it would weigh the boat down less or wouldn't it make sense since they have that whole sign and the boards break off very easily couldn't they have just put the boards underneath the boat to make it float better sort of like a raft I mean um I, I feel as though that would make more sense if you have these boards lying here you could put the boards underneath the boat to make it sort of like a raft and then it wouldn't sink so um, that's just me throwing some logic into the TV equation here. But uh, next up we have the Rosita storyline. I loved Rosita telling off Spencer at the gate. And um, it really makes a lot of sense for her character. Really like it. And overall I'm enjoying her character way more this season than I ever have. Because I've always thought that the actress was good. It's just that even with the actress being good, I've never been a fan of the character. I wasn't a fan of Rosita in the comics. Never really much of a fan of her in the show. She just seemed like she always had an attitude. She seemed uh, sort of, I don't know, she didn't really stand out a lot. Her having an attitude was usually her only character um, trait. But now we've seen a lot more range from her just in this one season. I know we saw a little bit before, but I feel like just this season we've seen her do a lot more and a lot more that's good, fun, enjoyable stuff. So I'm very happy with where the character has gone this season. Uh, so she goes with Eugene to go to the bullet manufacturing place and makes Eugene make her a bullet. They come back with the bullets. But while they're there, she really goes a little bit too far on Eugene in my opinion. And further, in my opinion, I feel like Eugene was kind of right in not wanting to make her a bullet. Eugene was right in saying we need to build our forces, we need to bide our time. With our current numbers, there is nothing we can do. Even if you by chance kill him, they will steamroll us in revenge. So I do think Eugene is right here. So um, yeah, I, I think Eugene would have been in the right to not make her a bullet. But it does seem like as long as they have the shells, it's a pretty simple process because the process for you guys that don't know really, really quick of making a bullet, pretty much if you have the shell casing, all you got to do is put in primer, gunpowder, or some sort of propellant, and then um, just a piece of metal to use as your um, actual projectile, really. So is, if they're at a plant where he can melt down or compact metal into that actual bullet projectile, um, then they should be good. They just put the projectile in the casing, of course putting the primer and gunpowder in it. Again, not sure what can and can't be used by gunpowder. I'm not like, well, I was going to say I'm not a chemist, but yeah, I do, I do know a little bit about chemistry. But um, yeah, so I'm not sure what all can be used as primer or gunpowder, but I'm sure that they can find things or have things that uh, make it pretty simple actually. Now that they have the facilities to do so, it's a pretty quick and easy process. Um, so I think it's interesting that they could make a lot more really. They don't have the guns to shoot them out of, but as long as they got the shells, they can make a lot of um, bullets. And you would figure that from all of the uh, walkers and stuff that they had sniped from up in the um, watchtower back when it was standing, from fighting all these uh, walkers and wolves and stuff before, there should be a lot of shells that they have just hanging around. A lot of expended shells. Don't know if they buried them somewhere or something, but they should have them. Um, so getting away from the Rosita and Eugene storyline, we have the Spencer and Gabriel stuff, and I love Gabriel. You guys um, maybe, maybe not know if you've been watching the channel for a while, that I really like Gabriel, and they're on a run together to go scavenge stuff for Negan, and I love how Gabriel put it in the car. You're not a sinner, but you're a tremendous shit. So, um, very cool. And I was honestly really, really scared there, because I totally was convinced that Spencer was going to kill him, because we see Spencer taking this bad guy turn of being against Rick, of being put down by Rosita, so having less to lose just really taking this darker turn. So I thought he was going to kill Gabriel to send him into full bad guy mode before the mid-season finale. Um, but I'm whew, I'm super glad it seems as though he didn't. I thought he was going to hit him with the car or something, stab him. I had no clue. Uh, and we still don't know where Gabriel is. I mean, we didn't see him there at the end, I don't believe. So I don't know if he got back, if he's still out there walking and Spencer came back without him or what. 
but Spencer happens to just, I had to have this scene explained to me, and the best explanation I could find online was that he heard a walker, and that's why he ran into the woods, but it seemed like Gabriel walked off, then he just takes off running into the woods, and if you heard a walker, why would you take off running into the woods? Like, it made, it made very little sense to me, but he happens to find a walker, and this walker happens to not only have a compound bow, but also to have, um a note in Latin leading to supply caches. Now that seemed convenient as hell, and of course Spencer um, just happens to know Latin. I mean, I took, what, three, four years of Latin in high school, so I know a bit as well. But I felt as though it was just very, very convenient. I'm just like, eh, whatever, it's not a huge negative, but it does seem incredibly convenient. Uh, so he gets back with all those supplies around the same time that Rosita and Eugene are getting back. Now, on to our main actual storyline. 11 minutes in, just getting to the main storyline. But the main storyline is with the saviors, really. So, it was interesting at the very beginning to see the saviors from the truck actually talking about what they do to deal with and avoid herds of walkers and to keep them away. So, it was interesting to see just how organized the saviors really are when it comes to this world. Um, and how well they've thought all of this out, even. So Jesus leaves a syrup trail behind the truck, and that is very smart realism on the part of the people making the show, because it seems shows in movies all the time. These people who the characters will follow the bad guy like this or something and just miraculously know their way back, where if Jesus has never been here, been to their place, um, then he has no clue how to get back. And I like, too, that he saw the statue and was like, okay, leave a trail from here because this statue works well as a marker, a waypoint. So I do think, or maybe he's seen it before, so I do think that makes a lot of sense. So I like that there. And, of course, Carl doesn't jump out with him. It's just, ah, Carl, you sly dog, got me again, says uh, Jesus. But, um... Not literally, of course. But Carl gets his assault rifle once they get to the sanctuary like he had in the comics. And he takes out two saviors with it. Which I thought was pretty cool. I thought it was weird how... And I thought it was cool too because I think it was definitely purposeful. The way he was like trying to aim where he's right-handed. But also his eye is taken out on that side. So he's trying to like aim across. I, I really did um, like that as well. Uh, I also loved Negan just calmly using the One Savior as a human shield. I thought that was a very um, funny thing to add in as well. Another thing that the show or that the episode did very well here, mixing the comedy of the stuff that did seem funny with the suspense of you never really knew if or when somebody was going to die or get seriously injured. So I liked that. There was still a lot of suspense mixed in with the funny parts. Uh, so I did love Negan this episode, as pretty much every episode. Dwight actually tackles and disarms Carl um, with the help of the distraction of another savior getting shot, of course. Um, but Negan then shows Carl around the sanctuary after, of course, threatening Daryl in order to get Carl to comply with him. Again, very smart on Negan's part. He really does well at controlling people. And I watched a video last week, actually, that was very good about somebody that, uh, some channel that sort of analyzes body language and does sort of videos on that sort of thing and social science, that kind of thing. And really, they broke down in analyzing Negan's body language and the body language of the characters around him. And the actors are playing it very, very well. It does seem like all of their movements and stuff are very, very well thought out and well directed. So I like the, um, I like the screenplay going on here. So, um, once all that happens, Negan gives a speech to the kneeling citizens inside the sanctuary. And, of course, the big panning shot of the sanctuary looked beautiful. Um, I don't even know if the show has actually called it Sanctuary yet, have they? I'm not even sure. But um, they had the big panning shot, and he gives the speech, which is really cool. Fresh, fresh vegetables tonight for everybody for free. See, Negan can be an agreeable ruler. Follow the rules and all that. But, um, yeah, he's still a very shitty person. So, um, Negan's harem is finally introduced, and we see Sherry pretty much sell out Amber and Mark. Like, well, let's just be real. She pretty much sells them out. So, um, she sells out Amber and Mark, and then once 
that goes down. We have Negan talking with Amber. Amber says, okay, I want to stay with Negan, because apparently the rules go as such, where you are married to Negan, so you can leave any time to go back to your husband and back to the system, but you can't cheat on him. And of course, the way he said it, going back to the system, made it seem like a threat. I'm not sure that it was a threat. I think he could have been serious. I'll give you a pretty good job, and I'll give Mark and your mom the same pretty good job. I don't think that, I mean, it was masked as a threat, like he would give him a shit job or kill him and put him on the wall or something. But um, I honestly think that he could have actually been serious about it, honestly. Uh, that's the thing. You never really know with Negan. Um, and that's the thing, but either way, it's clearly worded to make her, even if that's a good deal, to make her realize it is a better deal for her, survival-wise, to just stick with him and never go hungry again. Uh, so then Negan keeps picking at Dwight this episode, whether kissing Sherry or mentioning boating her. Um, so um, yeah, Negan keeps picking at Dwight. And he also then takes Carl into his private chambers and gets Carl to take the bandages off his eye. Thought the prosthetics looked really good. Um, at first glance, it seemed like, is that how, if you lost an eye, would it heal up like that? It didn't look, it didn't look like you could see in. It looked like just a red flat piece, like a blackish reddish flat piece there. Is that how would would it swell up or heal up scar-wise in that sort of way? I'm not really sure how it would heal up. Um, so I'm not sure if it would work like that or not. I would have to, I would have to look at some real actual eye injuries to, um, uh, to really know that. And I'm not sure that I want to. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Then we have Carl. He's still, he cries about Negan poking fun at his missing eye. And it makes a lot of sense. And the way that he did it wasn't just simply crying. It was seeming like he was just... He was dealing with, oh god, I've really lost my eye. And that makes a lot of sense because we see that Carl's still not used to not having one of his eyes. It's still a new thing to him. And I think that's something that if you lose, again, I have no personal experience, an arm, a leg, or an eye or something, it's probably a long process to really get used to that. You may never even really totally get used to it, especially for a kid. So it's probably kind of um, difficult for Carl right now still not having the eye. And to have somebody pick at that really, really um, breaks him down even more. Uh, but Negan actually breaks his Negan persona for the first time to apologize to Carl seemingly very sincerely. And we can see that in a way he sort of respects Carl uh, for being just this crazy badass little kid, or at least he's very, very interested in him. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I think it's cool as well as if you have this big personality that Negan puts out there, even if that's your real personality putting it out there, every once in a while you break, you have to be chill, you have to decompress. And to be constantly on and completely thinking and manipulating everyone all the time, Every once in a while, Negan's got a break from that, and it was interesting seeing Carl be the first one to kind of break him from that persona um, that he's built for himself. So then we had the Fat Joey scene, and that was all I was hoping for this episode. I was like, I hope we have the Baseball Bats Don't Have a Pussy um, scene from the comics in this episode, and we got it, and I thought it was hilarious. I just, I love all the Fat Joey jokes that they keep making, or when he walked in, he was like, oh, Fat Joseph. <laughs> so I just, I, I love all the Fat jo Joey scenes. I love the way he laughed when Negan made the joke. It was just, it was very good. I liked it. I, I'm liking the actor, too. Guy playing Fat Joey. Good job. Job. Um, I said he looked like John Chon the first time that uh, he was up on the show, and I still think he does. Uh, so then we actually have him having Carl sing the song and really breaking him down about his mom. Keep poking at what happened to his mom, and did his mom used to sing this to him? I think that uh, bringing up Lori like that really added more into maybe showing how Negan is purposefully trying to break him in a way where he purposefully put, he purposefully picks first at the physical insecurities that he obviously has, then going from physical insecurities to what would be the biggest, hardest thing for a kid, probably their mother, since it seems as though he's seen Rick, he's seen Carl, 
and he hasn't seen a mother, it seems as though that would be um, the next thing to pick at to really break him down. So then Negan gives his speech and we have the burning Mark scene. And when Mark was cast, I knew that this was coming and I was excited to see it coming. Personally, I wasn't sure how they were going to do it for the show, but I think they did it amazingly well. Because I was like, in the comics, the burn is sort of one of those, or the iron, it's one of those larger than life comic sort of uh, plot points where Dwight's burns are a lot more spread out and large in the comics. And to a point, I was like, I kind of wish they made Dwight's burns a bit more noticeable in the show, but they are still noticeable, and I feel as though they're more realistic than what I was expecting or maybe even hoping for a little. And the same thing goes with Burning Mark's face. I was like, how are they going to do that? Because in the comic, it's like melting his face off. Like, you know when you get one of those really greasy pizzas and you try to pull a slice apart and all the cheese kind of hangs on and drips off? In the comics, it was kind of like that with the iron in his face. And I was like, that's not super duper realistic. I mean, how are they going to do that for the show? And I think they did it very well. It looked a lot more realistic. It translated very well the way they did it in the show. So um, props to the special effects department for that, or I guess it would be makeup and special effects. Um, props to them for that. That was a good scene. And one huge thing that all the review... I've only watched a couple of reviews and reactions today. Usually I watch a ton, um, but over the course of a few days after an episode. But of all the reviews and reactions I've seen today, which have been very few... No one has brought up Daryl kneeling, and that was something that me and my sister watching, because we always watch together, my mom as well. Um, when we were watching, me and my sister noticed Daryl kneel. Daryl said, I'm never going to kneel, and Dwight said, I said that too, and that was a few episodes back. And now when Negan walked out there and everyone else kneeled, Daryl kneeled too. That was sort of a big deal really showing that Daryl is sort of broken he's kind of in his place now they have gotten in his head um he may not be totally broken but they have certainly gotten in his head uh so I did think that that was really important and I haven't seen anybody talk about that uh so Dwight and Sherry in the stairwell is next and I love the way that Dwight talked to her where he's like you sold him out right and he sort of throws it on her where she's like this was only supposed to affect me nobody else and Dwight brings up if you're still alive to this day you're alive at somebody else's expense whether like Rick and his gang you're alive at maybe the expense of some bad people or some of your friends that have fallen along the way or if you're alive at the expense of others in a bad way like you took out others to secure your own survival like a lot of um, what the saviors have done so I do think it was great that he put it that way. Like, if you're alive, it's because you're... If, or if you're still standing, it's because you're standing on somebody else's back, I think is the way he put it. It was just really good. And, of course, Dwight is my favorite character character in the comics, so I'm loving um, just more good things with Dwight. Um, so then we have the scene of Carl telling off Negan. I really, really liked this. Then they go to go back to Alexandria, and Jesus is on top of the truck. And it seems like Daryl sees him. No clue with... Jesus jumps off the truck into the sanctuary or if he maybe um, hides in the truck and goes with Negan and Carl. I kind of feel like he hides in the truck and goes with Negan and Carl. Um, I know that seems less likely in a lot of ways, but for some reason that's just what my gut told me. Uh, but everybody else seems to think he stayed at the sanctuary and that does make sense for the way that Daryl was looking and the way he wasn't on the truck at that angle. But also, to me, it doesn't make total sense because the truck was going out of the sanctuary. If he was planning to sneak into the sanctuary, why would he wait until they were outside the gates to jump off the truck? At least, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it was going. So I'm not totally sure where Jesus is right now at the moment. But he could be in the truck. He could be at Alexandria now because of that. Or he could be at um, Sanctuary. Or he could have just made a run for it back to the hilltop to tell everybody where Sanctuary is. Who knows? Um, anything possible at this point. Then we've got uh, Daryl in his cell and under the door slides a note, a key, and a match. The match seems like the weirdest one. The key, a lot of people have said, is maybe a key to a motorcycle or a truck. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, not sure about the match though and the note just says go now. Um, 
I, me, my whole family disagreed. I think uh, my mom and my sister, one said, oh, it's Sherry. And then one of them said, oh, it's Jesus. Jesus broke in. And then I said, oh, it's Dwight. Because I was like, Negan's been picking at Dwight a freaking lot this episode. We had to see him get another dude's uh, face burnt off. Uh, Negan made, made out with his wife. He made fun of Bone and his wife. Like, Dwight has taken a lot of shit. And I think this may be the breaking point. And maybe seeing Daryl Neal as well. He's like... Dwight's sort of like, I don't want to see Daryl get broken like I was. Maybe tell him to go now. Um, so I'm not sure. There's a lot of things. And because Daryl doesn't know who left the note, then if it doesn't work out and Daryl gets captured, Dwight can say, I didn't leave the note. He didn't see me do it. So, um, yeah, I my personal bet is on Dwight for that. Uh, it could be Sherry. It could be... Um, it could be Jesus as well, because it looked like kind of girly handwriting on the note, so the handwriting kind of makes me think Sherry. But uh, also, the handwriting, I could see Jesus having kind of girly handwriting. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It could be anybody, but my bet was on Dwight. Um, Sherry, I could also very strongly see. Not too sure about Jesus, though. That one seems like a bit more of a stretch, because Jesus would have had to have found the key to something and made the note, got the match. Seems like uh, I'd be a little bit more difficult if it were, um, a little bit more difficult if it were Jesus. Uh, not that he couldn't do it. Uh, so then we are back at Alexandria with Negan and Carl, and Negan and Olivia, all the scenes with them are perfect. I love how well the past, or the episodes this season, Olivia as a minor character, and you know as the show we have some minor characters that sort of build their way up to be more major as some of the major characters die off. And I like how we're building Olivia up a little bit more, having her shown a little bit more, and the actress is doing a wonderful job. I loved the scenes with Negan and Olivia, and I now ship Negan and Olivia for life. So, um, yep, and then pretty much at the end, Negan takes a tour of the house, and then he gets Judith and just plays around with Judith. And so when Rick would, when Rick presumably returns next episode, it's going to be pretty um, pretty interesting. I'm really waiting for Rick to just walk in. Negan's sitting there clean-shaven next episode, apparently, just uh, playing with Judith or something. It'd be very, very funny. Um, also, main basic thoughts on the episode as a whole, now that we've gone through it part by part. Uh, this was obviously almost a 30-minute um, review, probably my longest review this season, so it is definitely the most content heavy episode this season, and I loved how much content there was. Oh, yes. So, um, it was amazingly paced as well. I love the pacing, and it was a very, very fun to watch. A wonderful blend between the comedy and the suspense, as I've said before. Um, and the only really dull parts, I think, were the Michonne parts seemed like they were just trying to give her something to something to do and they didn't really seem that important so for this one i'm going to give it 9.5 um geez i don't even know 9.5 harems face burnings i have no idea face pizzas uh 9.5 out of 10 almost perfect but i mean not completely perfect this one i would say is my second favorite of the season and you guys know i love that um episode two was the kingdom episode i love that kingdom intro episode i love the oceanside and terra episode as well maybe not as much as the kingdom episode though this one is second though it it fights for first honestly with that first episode but it's hard to compare the two the first i think was beautifully made I think the production was amazing, the writing was amazing, but the thing is, it's a very down, it's a very slow, methodical, um, brutal, hard to watch episode that you're like, it's very, very good, but it's hard to rewatch it too much. And then this was one of those where I feel like I could rewatch it a million times. I felt like it was lighter, faster pace. It still had the tension and action, but it felt, um, it just felt more fun. It was a more fun episode. Nobody that you really liked really died. Um, and then even the brutal stuff that happened was good action, but nobody really important to us suffered heavily from it. So this was a really, really good episode. And uh, I loved it. Almost perfect. So um, that's all I got to say. Pretty much 30-minute review. So uh, damn, this is my longest one yet. But I <laughs> review almost as long as the freaking show. Um 
so yeah like if you did like this video guys and um comment down there and tell me what you thought of this episode and what you thought of my thoughts on it uh subscribe for more the walking dead both comics and tv show new comic issue will be coming out this wednesday two days from now so i will have a live reaction up on wednesday and a review up on thursday with any and all hopes um Follow on Twitter as well if you want to. I'll try to keep you updated there on stuff for the channels, whatever, stuff like that. Um, just random Twitter, whatever. And uh, that's it. So thank you guys one last time for watching so very much, and I'll see you all next time.